My boy ain't playing. He's rocking, you know what I mean? Star David. Not ashamed. I'm sure you guys have seen what's gone on in the last 24 hours. So, you know, continue to keep Israel in prayer. You know, Iran released that attack on them. Uh, but they had, uh, you know, UN forces and, 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 and American forces help to uh, kind of hush that. And, and Israel's uh, very strategic uh, defense systems had uh, taken down, you know, the rockets that the, uh, the missiles that the drones had sent. But again, this is the thing as, as time goes on, as we continue to draw closer to, you know, the final day, you're going to see more of this and it's going to get more intense and it's going to get, uh, there's going to be more chaos, more bloodshed. Uh, the thing is, we have to be grounded. This is why you take seriously your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, with Father God. Because when it hits the fan, nothing or no one else is going to be able to keep you stable and to keep you secure, but the love and the truth of Father God. The word is clear that, in the latter days, when the final Antichrist rises up, there's going to be many that are deceived. They're going to be deceived because, uh, as Scripture says, they're searching for, for signs and wonders. And he's going to, he's going to, he's going to falsify uh, this supernatural power that he has. And he's going to do things that are going to make him seem like he is the, the coming Messiah. But he's not. So this is why we have to lock in every day, take hold of the truth of Scripture. We don't. When we don't let ourselves be led by our emotions <laughs> and, and, and we ask for discernment so that we can see clearly and precisely truth and falsehood. And then we're able to weigh out from what the scripture says. This is either correct or incorrect. Amen. This is very interesting. I, I came across this scripture and, and I just I need to share it because. It really just moved uh, my heart and it gave me a better understanding of blessing. So Leviticus chapter 9 verse 22 tells us, Then Aaron lifted up his hands towards the people and blessed them and came down from offering the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings. When you read this scripture way back in, 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 in uh, the Torah or the Old Testament in Leviticus chapter 9 verse 22, this was the first time a priestly blessing was ever given. You may say, well, okay, so what? What's the significance of this? Even though this principle and this practice has become a foundational tradition in the Jewish faith that's continued till today, nowhere in the Bible will you find that the priests are actually commanded to bless the nation. And this is the interesting thing because According to Jewish teachings and traditions, by its very nature, a blessing must be heartfelt. It must be heartfelt. That means in order for a blessing to have power and influence, it must come from the innermost being of someone giving the blessing. One that gives the blessing must have a sincere desire to see the person blessed prosper. Doesn't that blow your mind? Like, you, you, it's not something that's rote. It's not something that it's just this mechanical robotic, I do this and I just say this. No, it, it's, think of God. He's not obligated to bless us. Remember, he has, he is relationship. He has perfect communion within himself, within the Godhead. Yet, out of his love, he freely gave and he wanted to see us blessed. No obligation to, but he does it. He loves you and I so much that he gave of himself. He gave. We just sang it. You give your own one and only son. Whoever believes in him will live forever. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit has to say to the churches. I don't know. I just was super juiced on that. I was so excited and I shared it with someone at my work and it was cool, man. He was like, yeah, man, I never thought about it like that. Like, yeah, bro. Like. I want to be like that. I want to be that person that that blesses people, that blesses my wife, that blesses my children, that blesses the people I come across, that blesses the congregation out of a desire to see people do better, to want to see people move forward and grow. That's where we need to be today, church. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, 
I'm just super juiced. There's a, there's, you know, there's no reason to not be pumped up because we are, like I said, soldiers in the Lord's army. There's a lot of work to be done. And through his power and through his will in God's love, we will administer these things to the people around us and be blessed ourselves. Um, we're in the last chapter of Ecclesiastes, y'all. I don't know how long it's been. Been a year, half a year. I don't know. I don't keep track. But all I know is we've been in this book for a while. Uh, we're, fi- we're finally coming to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Uh, we started back in the end of July last year. Oh, there you go. I, I love expository preaching. Verse by verse, brick by brick. I mean, there ain't nothing wrong with topical teaching, but I love the expository preaching. Let's just go verse by verse and figure this out and see what nuggets of truth are in the word of God. With that said, we're in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. We'll be going through verses 1 down through 8. This message is entitled, Remember Your Creator in Your Youth. So when you get there, if you have a Bible, um, turn to it. Please stand for the reading of God's Word. We also got the text on the screen behind me on the TVs. We got a couple paperback Bibles back there. You can grab those as well. I don't care. Use your phone. Do whatever you need to do. Just get yourself locked in. So once again, we're starting in verse 1 of chapter 12. And it says, Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near, of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars and are darkened and the clouds return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men are bent and the grinders cease because they are few. And those who look through the windows are dimmed and the doors on the street are shut when the sound of the grinding is low and one rises up at a sound of a bird and all the daughters of song are brought low. Verse 5. They are afraid also of what is high and terrors that are in the way. The almond tree blossoms. The grasshopper drags itself along and desire fails because man is going to his eternal home. And the mourners go out about the streets before the silver cord is snapped or the golden bowl is broken or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the cistern. Verse 7, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. Let us pray. Yahweh, we come before you and we humble our hearts. We ask that you would intervene in our circumstances today, in our situation, be in our midst. Please uh, fill us fresh with the Holy Spirit and empty us of ourselves. We want to model ourselves after your son Christ. And as Moses said, if you don't go before us, we don't want to go. Lord, we need you to manifest yourself before us so that we can have revelation, so that we can have clear understanding of the scripture of the text and we can see how it is totally applicable to our lives wherever we're at right now. Everyone's coming here with a different baggage, with a different load of circumstances. But Lord, you know that and you know exactly what they need. I pray you would speak to your people. I pray that they would have ears to hear what you have for them today. Father, please bless us with a fresh anointing and may we leave this building changed for the better. If we need to be challenged, challenge us. If we need to be convicted, convict us. If we need to be encouraged, encourage us. If we need to sense your loving grace, do that. All of that, whatever it is we need, meet us where we're at, Father. We ask this all in the priceless name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. (laughs) Let me get this. Like I said, we're starting the book of Ecclesiastes, or the last chapter uh, this morning, and uh, it's been so fun. I've enjoyed myself. Um, Do you find yourself enjoying more and more of God's Word as you grow and get older? Man, I'm 45 now. When I was 35, I wasn't on fire like I'm on fire today. I wasn't feeling the same way when I was 25. I look at these 10-year intervals, and I'm like, no, this is great. I feel like, David, just let me dwell in your house all the days of my life. I don't I don't want him to take his Holy Spirit from me. And it's very interesting because, again, as I talked about earlier, um, all that's going on in the world, you're seeing the, the restrainer lift his hand more and more. That's why you're seeing more and more wickedness going on. Lawlessness has been at work. We should not be surprised that all of this is going on. It has to take place. It's not all doom and gloom. For those 
who are chosen and elect and will be saved and are already saved. It's just a bad look for those who are just simply living for themselves and living for this world. This world is not our home. Don't try to fill everything in your life with here. That's where sometimes Christians, we get caught up because our circumstances aren't ideal. And then we think God don't love us. Go back to the Old Testament and look at all the people who never got what they thought they were supposed to get. Look, go to Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith, and look of all the people who never saw their blessings truly manifest this side of heaven. But they're aliens, they're, they're soldiers, they're foreigners of this land. This land is not their home. There's something so much greater for you and I on the other end. Amen? Yeah. And as I said, there's, there's so much godly wisdom and insight in this book alone. And I just pray that if you've been coming consistently, you've been coming faithfully to, 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 to hear the word of God and to grow in your walk with Christ. I just pray that the preaching and the teaching of the word of God has blessed you. With that being said, we have several main points. And the first one is this. It is in your best interest to serve God in your youth rather than waiting until you are old. We see this first statement in verse one. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth. We have talked about this many times before. You see, the most important decision that you and I have to make is not two weeks from now, not two years from now. It's the decision that you're making right now in this present moment. You see, yesterday is gone forever You're never going to relive yesterday. It's out of here, baby. It's not coming back. And we don't have any real certainty of how long we're actually going to live. We don't know. We don't know the time we're going to check out. We don't know the moment the Lord is going to call us home. So in light of this fact that even the present moment right now is ever fleeting, We would be wise to recognize Yahweh, Shalom, the Lord of peace, the true and living God right now in the moment and serve him. We would be wise to. That we would make up our minds right now to commit to him and to serve him alone all the days of our lives. Like from here on out, Lord, I'm going to serve you. It doesn't matter what I go through. It doesn't matter what comes against me. I'm even willing to die for you. I'll give my life for you. That's where we need to be. It it, it needs to be so ingrained in us that we're not going to vacillate back and forth. But we're we're here and and we're locked in and we're going to do this. Because it's the best life to live. You know, it's interesting because the Lord says over and over, I give you the choice. I give you blessing or curses, heaven or hell, life or death. We just need to choose life. The reason why certain people are living the way they're living is because the reality is, we were talking about this in prayer. Go back to Cain. Cain didn't want to repent, so Cain had to roam. He, God gave him what he wanted. You look at Pharaoh. Pharaoh repented, but it was a false repentance. It was just an emotional thing in the moment. He didn't really want to serve the true and living God. So God said, you know what? Go ahead. You're going to harden your own heart. <laughs> it said, look at the, read the text. It says, it says Moses hardened his heart. It said Pharaoh hardened his heart. It said God hardened his heart. Ultimately, it was Pharaoh himself that hardened his own heart. God just gave him what he wanted. So if you and I continue to vacillate and do and do this little thing and just step out and step out and step out, God one day, heaven forbid, he says, you know what? Go ahead. I'm going to give you what you want and you'll be miserable. Don't do it. Don't play games with God. He's not to be played with. Amen. We need to make up our minds and commit to him and to serve him all the days of our lives. Again, if we this is this is the dangerous thing, because if we brush it off and think, oh, well, I'll, you know, I'll come back. I'll come back because some people will be like, oh, I'll come to the church house and then I won't come for three weeks and then I'll come back and then I won't come back. And, then I'll, you know, the reality is, and it's not about the church house. It's, it's really about a relationship with you, but you need to be in fellowship with the saints. But this is the reality. If we brush it off and put it off, the reality is that day may never come again. Second Corinthians chapter six, 
verse 2 tells us, for he says, in a favorable time, I have listened to you. And in a, in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable, favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You and I have to strike while the iron is hot. That's the first main point. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. The second main point is this. Everyone will return to their creator when they enter into eternity, either to be rewarded with eternal life with him or to be separated forever apart from him. There's there's nothing else. There's no coming back as a butterfly, coming back as a sloth. Do these weird things talking about reincarnate. No, you were not reincarnating, man. That's not happening. You got one shot at this. I got one shot at this. And then we go before our maker. Verse 7 tells us, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. This is the reality for every single person who was ever created. No matter what you choose to believe this, or what you choose to believe in, whether you believe it or you believe it's fake, this is the fate we all must face when we pass on. We will stand before the holy God, of the universe, and we will give an account of our lives here on earth. Romans chapter 14, verse 12 tells us, so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. We don't want to go before him ashamed. That's got to be the worst feeling and experience ever, is to not be prepared when you need to go before the Lord. The third main point is this, apart from a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ, All is vanity. Notice I said genuine, not perfect. (laughs) It needs to be genuine. But anything else that's not a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ, it's just all vanity. That's all it is. Vanity of vanity simply means the pointlessness of human activity. Everything ultimately is empty, futile, and short-lived apart from God. It doesn't matter if you're wise or a fool Because everyone ends up dying. Vanity used here is not quite the same as conceited or conceitedness. We're not talking about the kind of vanity where people are constantly looking in the mirror, posing and posturing, trying to make sure they look great, checking themselves in the mirror. Even though that is a faint sense of the meaning here in vain. But vain also means futile and pointless. A life lived apart from God is meaningless. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 14 tells us, I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after the wind. The reason why everything is pointless apart from Christ is because he's the only one that can truly fulfill us. He's the only one. He's the only person. He's the only one that can make us whole, that can make us complete, that can give us the sense of meaning that we're all searching for. Nothing else can ever fill that void. All right, let's go ahead and break down these verses. I'm going to spend a length's time in verse 1 because there's a lot here. It says, remember also your creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come And the year draws near of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Okay, this just this first statement. Remember now your creator. This is imperative as followers of Christ, as human beings, really. Uh, The reality that there is a creator. This is so important and this is so pivotal. You see, the reality is if you are honest with yourself, You didn't ask to be here. No one asked to be alive. No one asked to be born. No one asked to be created. No one one said, I want to be in this family. I want to be in that family right there. With all the stuff that goes on, I want to be in that one. (laughs) If you had your pick, would you be in the family you're in? (laughs) Don't answer. (laughs) Don't answer. No one asked to be what race or creed they were born into or born to be. Whatever you look like, that's how it is. That's how the Lord decided to make you. You had no decision in that. He said, I'm going to make you like this. 
<laughs> I'm going to make you with this kind of temperament. I'm going to give you these kind of characteristics. I'm going to give you these kind of strengths. I'm going to give you these kind of weaknesses, but I'm going to fashion and form you in such a way that you are fearfully and wonderfully created. And that is his handiwork. You are his handiwork. I am his handiwork. No one asked to be born in the time in history of his story that we were brought into the world. There's a reason why you're still alive in 2024, whatever age you are, whether young or old. You weren't born in the 1700s, the 1600s. You weren't. You were born when you were born and you're alive right now for a purpose. Still, the fact remains you and I were created by our creator, There is a designer. We are the design. He is the designer. He is the one who fashioned us the way we are. You see, he he is unrivaled. And as unrivaled as he is, he is, again, eternal life without being created. Try to wrap your mind around that for real. For real, for real. That's a mystery of God that we'll never figure out. We're created life. He is life without being created. He's existed forever. He's always been and always will be. And this is another mystery. I talked about it uh, introducing this message. Even though he has need of nothing, he gets pleasure out of you. Take it personal. See, I think many times we don't personalize the love of God enough in our own lives. We look at all these other people and say, oh, man, he's blessed. He's loved. He's, she's blessed. She's loved. You're blessed. You're loved. He gets pleasure out of seeing you. When, you. when you have fun enjoying your children, he gets pleasure out of that. When he sees you doing healthy, wholesome things and you enjoy doing it, if you like baking, if you like building something, if you like fishing, if you like swimming, whatever it is, He actually enjoys you enjoying those things. Just like a grandparent enjoys their grandchildren. It's so real. It is. Out of his love and desire to create beings to love him back, that is precisely why you and I were created. To be loved by God and to love him back equally. So much so That even after humanity sinned against him, he gave his only begotten son. There's only one, and it's the the man God, Christ Jesus. He gave him us to pay in full our sin debt. Tetelestai. It's paid in full. It's done. You don't have to do anything good to, to pay him. You can't pay him back. I can't pay him back. He's like, just receive it. With a childlike faith, receive it and enjoy me and enjoy the blessing of being free from sin and being broken from the bondage. You don't have to go back like a dog to the vomit. That's what he's saying to us today. He's like, enjoy me thoroughly. He wants you to. Don't ever feel ashamed of enjoying the richness of God and the things that he allows you to enjoy, mainly himself and all the other assets. That's cool. And we, we never preach here that money's evil. I, I can't stand when people say that. <laughs> it, it's lusting after it, it, anything. But obviously the scripture says it's the lusting after it. Now I've got to do anything for it. Oh, I just got to build an empire. No, that's wrong. Use it, enjoy it, have it, but don't let it govern your life. Let Yahweh, let God Almighty govern your life and be the Lord of your life. Amen. That, my friend, what we're speaking of, that's unspeakable love. That's the love of God. This is the first mention of God as creator in the book of Ecclesiastes. Up to this point, Solomon the preacher worked hard to ignore the eternal God one must stand before in the future. He didn't want to acknowledge it. He, tr- he tried to sidestep it. He tried to find any other way to speak of it. He finally had to come to the place where it's like, no, the creator God we have to answer to. He also refused to think about the creator God who existed before he did. But why? We have to ask the question, why did, he, why did he try to ignore this? We kind of talked about this last week, but we'll bring it up again because I think it's important. Because this self-imposed ignorance relieves people of the sense of accountability before the creator. Which it doesn't really matter because we're still accountable to him. 
But you think about it. Many people do this today. Why, why do people not want to walk lock in step with God? <laughs> they don't want to give up their sin. They, they, they love their sin more than they love God. Like, nah, man, I got to drink, bro. Now I got to go to the club. Nah, man, I got to make this money. No, nah, I'm, I'm doing this. I have these illicit relationships. I'm not willing to give that up because I love it too much. They may not say it, but they don't have to say it because the fruit comes out. We talked about that being fruit, good, excellent fruit inspectors, first with our own lives, then with other people. Look at the fruit in your life. Does the fruit in your life show that? No, man, I will sacrifice everything for God. I didn't say perfectly, but that's your heart's desire. Or are you bound by the stuff and the things and the experiences that are short lived, that sin it loses its luster so quick? It's worse than a plated gold chain. It just it, it just it just corrodes so quick. And then you got to get more. I know this is a heavy message, but you know what? The word of God is heavy, y'all, because we're dealing with eternity in the balance and souls not going to hell and souls going to heaven. The application is this. If, if we don't acknowledge God as our creator, <laughs> we ultimately believe we can do whatever we want. <laughs> we see this in the world today. People that do whatever they want without regard to human life. Remember, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. People that don't do that, they don't do that because they don't believe that they're accountable to God. So they feel like they can do whatever they want. They don't think that they have to be accountable to a power greater than themselves. But this is simply a lie from the pit of hell. This is what Satan wants you and I to believe. He wants people that are lost to truly believe that so they can stay lost and not get saved. You see, because when we fail to remember and recognize our creator. The reality is our so-called freedom actually turns into a bondage. To whatever desire is governing our heart and our flesh. Do you notice that nowadays it's all about these movements? (laughs) This movement, that movement. I don't need to name them. I'm sure y'all are familiar with all the different things and people want to go out and march And they want to yell and scream and they want to say this and that. And it's my right and it's my choice and it's my freedom. I I don't even smash on those people. They're just unchurched, unschooled in biblical truth. It's not about your right. What right do you have? (laughs) What right do I have but to serve the all-knowing God who gave his one and only son so that we could be redeemed? We have it twisted. We have it twisted. And it's crept into the church where people think that I have the right to do whatever I want. We'll get into that in a minute. An example of this. Someone who thinks I can eat whatever I want. I can eat whatever I want. (laughs) Don't tell me what I can eat. The Bible says I can eat pork. I'm not being legalistic. I'm just trying to tell a joke, but you know. (laughs) <laughs> you can eat pork, you know, right? He says it's not what goes in your mouth that defiles you. It's what comes out of your heart, man. If it's come out of you, wickedness, you know, whatever. But the person who says I can eat whatever I want, man, I can drink whatever I want. I can wear whatever I want. I can go wherever I want. I can do whatever I want with my body because it's mine. Whoever says that fails to understand that they will at some point become a slave to their appetite, And be driven to be consumed by whatever desire is driving them. It happens all the time. I've heard many people say, I can stop drinking whenever I want. And yet they wind up addicted to alcohol and end up destroying their lives. Or I'm not, uh, I'm not going to the strip club. I'm just looking at something on my computer. Bro, you're married, homie. You shouldn't be looking at any of that. Or I, I just talked to her at work. Bro, you're having an illicit, emotional, adulterous relationship. We have to understand everything starts with a thought. That's why the Bible says take every thought captive. Every single thought. Nobody murders anybody without thinking about it. Nobody commits adultery against their husband or their spouse without thinking about it. 
Nobody embezzles $500,000 from the church house without thinking about it. I'm sorry I'm yelling, but man, I, I, it just, I'm bubbling up with this because it's the truth. We have to govern our minds by the word of God and what Christ says. We have to ask for discernment. Ask Father to discipline you. That way you're going to know the truth. And what did Jesus say? The truth is going to set you free. (laughs) Then you're going to be clear and free to be like, you know what? No, I'm not doing that. You don't know how many times demonic thoughts come through my mind and I'm constantly having to rebuke thoughts that are so gross and grotesque and so filthy. I haven't watched anything like that in almost 14, 15 years. So it's not that. It's that thoughts, unclean thoughts, evil thoughts from the realm of darkness are intelligent. They have an intelligence. Think about this. You can ask a doctor or a scientist, cancer has an intelligence. It literally infiltrates the human body and it wants to destroy and inflict death and pain. It wants to kill the body. Where does that come from? It comes from the realm of darkness. It's the same thing with thoughts. Again, that's why the Bible says take every single thought captive and force it to Be subjected to the authority of Jesus Christ. If you and I are not doing that on a daily basis, I can guarantee you your walk with the Lord is shaky at best. This is how raw we have to be with ourselves, right? You got to do it for yourself. I can't do it for myself. Look 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 at King Saul. This is not even in my notes, but this is the Holy Spirit talking, I believe it. Look at King Saul. He had a demonic spirit messing with him all the time. It only went away when David came and played the harp because David was filled with the Holy Spirit. As soon as David left, that demonic spirit came back. So what that tells me is Saul needed to be about his father's business, get his relationship in alignment with God correct so that he, through the power of the Holy Spirit, could fight off that demonic spirit. You see what I'm saying? So we have to take accountability for our own walk with the Lord and make sure that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we're making sure that we're getting set free from the things that can easily entangle us. But we got to be aware, church. We got to be aware. <sighs> okay. <laughs> and, 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 and here, by the way, our, our bodies are, are technically not our own. Because we've all been bought with a price. And now if we confess Christ Jesus as our Savior and Lord, our bodies are the temple of the living God. So that was my whole point. You can't do whatever you want with your body. I can't do whatever I want with my body. You can't just go lay with any old person. You can't just go go, go hanging out any old place. Because the Holy Spirit lives in you. And you don't want to create an environment where the Holy Spirit is grieved. Because you're dragging the Holy Spirit somewhere he don't want to go. It's like if you were strung out on crack and you're talking about, I'm going to go back to the crack house and minister to people. You got to know your own weakness, man. Don't go smoking that pipe talking about you're going to go save people. Right. Because our theology is all whacked out. First of all, we don't save nobody. It's, the, it's, it's Father God who saves. We're just called to be heralds and witnesses. But you got to know your own weaknesses. That's why I don't mess around with alcohol. That's why I don't mess around with no strip clubs. That's why I don't mess around with a bunch of people that I used to run with. That's why I got a bunch of older men that are my best friends now because they're solid men in the Lord. And that's who I surround myself with because I can't afford to be hanging out with people from back then. And it's not about not witnessing the people. The Lord has given me a whole different demographic and a whole group, different group of people to witness to. But you got to know your own weaknesses so you don't fall out. Amen. Amen. First Corinthians chapter six, verse 19 and 20 tells us. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. The term creator here is a plural form in Hebrew. We're still on this creator. I know, I know, we're moving on. But this term is a plural form in Hebrew, suggesting greatness of majesty. Remember, There is a perfect community within the Godhead. God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and the person of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Plural, not singular. That's like, again, when um, uh, El Shaddai and all the different names 
when uh, Elohim, uh, him in Hebrew, it means the plural. So when it, when it talks about in the beginning, God, you can substitute that for when it's the Torah talks about it. Elohim created the world. He said, when he talks about, let us create man in our own image. What, what, well, what is it? Who's it? It's not angels because angels are not that. It was the Godhead talking about themselves. Let, let us make humanity in our own image. So we see that when it talks about creator here, it's speaking of plurals. Again, speaking of this Godhead. We are created in God's moral image. Think about this for a minute, church. Why do you think human beings crave relationships of some kind? At the, at the most micro level, every human being craves relationship. Because God is relationship and we're made in his image. So everybody longs for relationship no matter who you are. Nobody wants to be solo bolo. I don't care how tough you are. I don't care how hard you are. I don't care how much of a gangster you are. No, you don't want to be alone. These gangsters ain't alone. They all click up with somebody. They ride with their homies. Look at the jails. Look at the prisons. Everybody has to click up. If you've been to prison or you've been to jail, you know what I'm talking about. You got to ride with somebody. You can't just, you can't just be solo bolo because everybody needs relationship because we're created in the image of God and God has perfect union, communion within himself. He goes on to say, remember now your creator in the days of your youth. Solomon knew that youth are often the most likely to discount the reality of eternity and the eternal God. This is natural but regrettable in youth because they are often the most difficult to convince that life is merely a brief prelude into eternity. Why? Those of you are, that are older, you know this. Because when you're young, you think you're invincible. You think you're going to live forever. You think, it's ne- you think time is never going to run out. You're like, man, are you serious? You see how healthy I am? You see how much I can bench press? You see how fast I can run the 40-yard dash? You see, how, you see who, where I got accepted to for school because I'm so smart at my SAT scores? Bro, I'm going to be the next Bill Gates. Young people think they're going to do it all. <laughs> but that is simply youthful ignorance. Again, because of sin, unfortunately, everybody has to die. There is no getting around this irrefutable truth. Regardless if you like it or not or agree with it or not, this is what is true because of the fallen nature of human beings. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 tells us, And just as it is appointed for man once to die, after that comes judgment. The application is this. Simply remember God. Consider your creator now. <laughs> remember him in your youth, in everything that you do. Don't fail to give God the first and the best of who you are. Again, this draws from the spiritual law of first fruits. Give him the best of yourself in the beginning of each and every day. Whether it's your time your talents, your resources. Use what you have been given to steward to honor God. Proverbs chapter 3 verses 9 and 10 tell us, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all you produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. I say this all the time. If you're struggling with joy in your life, ask yourself, are you starting your day with God? I can guarantee you because it's an irrefutable biblical spiritual truth. If you're not starting your day with the Lord, that's why your joy is ceasing. I didn't say your circumstances are going to change. If you got to walk through a difficult circumstance, you're still going to walk through that difficult circumstance. But your perspective is going to be completely different because he orders your steps. If you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. This is something that we just have to do, church. It doesn't matter if you feel like it. Serving Christ isn't about feeling. It's not about emotions. It's about obedience. That's how you that's how you can gauge where your love is with God for real, for real, for real, for real is your obedience. Right. Because I can talk all this. But if I'm living like hell out there at home, then all this is nothing. (laughs) It's just a bunch of talk. It's just Pharisaic. But if you are actively walking in obedience with God one moment at a time to the best of your God-given ability, then that's how you gauge, man, I, I really love God. You know what I mean? Because you can't say, I love God, and I'm out, homie, let's go get this six-pack, man. Let's go get these blunts, bro. We're going to do, do blah, blah, blah. We're going to go to Matrix. I'm going to go gamble. What are you doing, bro? You were just at the church house, man. 
Now, are you hanging with this whole other group of people? And don't, don't, and the people say it all the time under the cloak, I'm trying to witness. Stop it. <laughs> We're supposed to have unbelievers that are our friends. We are. But our unbelieving friends should not be influencing us more than we are influencing them. Again, know your weaknesses. If you can't go in that crowd, don't go in that crowd. If it's going to make you compromise your witness to the Lord, that's not a good thing. And like I said, I I totally understand that everyone comes to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord at different points of their lives. That's that's fine. We're 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 not talking about that, right? Let's not split hairs here. But what the scripture is saying here is this. Because you are more active and more vigorous when you are young, it would be wise to remember your creator in your youth and serve him from that point on. Because it will be so much easier in your youth to believe, to hope, to pray, to love, to obey, to bear your cross when you are youthful rather than when you are of an older age. An example of this, uh, I was telling the men this morning, uh, me and my wife, we were blessed to go to Gene and Fred Scott's house yesterday. We got to anoint them with oil and pray for them and uh, pray for Nathan. And, uh, you know, we had we had Kalos and Tirza with us. We, we just had to take them with us. And Tirza, you know, fortunately, you know, she can get a little wound up and she fell asleep. So the Lord allowed her to fall asleep and not be a distraction. But but my but our son got to see it all. He got to witness, you know, me anointing their heads with oil, laying hands on them, my wife praying for them, me praying for them. And, and, and it was cool because it's like he's young. He's eight years old. And it's like. I pray that, you know, those, those kind of images don't ever leave his mind that he remembers it when he gets older. Like, no, this is what it's about. This is, it, this is what it is to be a blessing to other people, to go to someone's house, to pray for them, to, to show, to have fellowship with them, to inquire about how they're doing. And, 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 and these are the things that, that the scripture is talking about. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Don't wait till you're so old. Why wait when he's calling us now? He says, before the difficult days come and the years draw near to where you say, I have no pleasure in them. The preacher advises young people to remember God and eternity before they suffer greatly by exposing themselves to a life lived apart from God and all the meaninglessness that is associated with it. You see, God loves you so much that he doesn't want you to have to suffer more than you need to. All right. Verses two through five. Um, It says before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain in the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men are bent and the grinders cease because they are few. And those who look through the windows are dimmed and the doors on the street are shut when the sound of the grinder grinding is low and one rises up to the sound of a bird and all of the daughters of song are brought low. They are afraid also of what is high and terrors that are in the way. The almond trees blossom, the grasshopper drags itself along, and desires fail because man is going to his eternal home, and the mourners go about in the streets. We see this first statement, while the sun, while the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are not darkened. Most biblical scholars believe, and they agree, that this is a poetic description of the effects of advanced aging. This is, this is kind of what happens as you get older. Um, for example, arms and hands that keep the body are now, uh, they begin to tremble. You know, what is, what is that associated? Alzheimer's, right? You, you're trembling a lot. The keeper of the house trembles. Parkinson's. Or Parkinson's disease. Thank you. The legs and the knees begin to sag. This is when strong men uh, uh, bow down a teeth are lost and chewing is more difficult the grinders cease because they are few the eyes are dim the windows grow dim right this is all poetic expression the ears become weaker and weaker the sound of grinding is low it's hard to hear i mean i'm, I'm already like man i can't i can't hear my my wife a, a, a room away and don't get the kids screaming i'm like ah what i gotta get up i can't hear i really can't the sleep becomes more difficult and, and one is easy to waken. One rises up at the sound of a bird. Singing and music are less appreciated. This is the daughters of music are brought low. One becomes more fearful in life, afraid of height and of terrors in the way. The hair becomes white. The almond trees blossom. The one, the one who was once active becomes weak. The grasshopper is burdened. 
This whole passage, the passions and desires of life are weakened and wane. Desire fails. And then he says, for man goes to his eternal home and the mourners go about in the streets. The application is this. At the end of one's life is their eternal resting place. Not the unknown grave or just darkness. They're, 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 no, you go to your eternal resting place. Solomon has now connected man's advanced age in connection with eternity, not vanity. And still today, many people view the supernatural and eternity in such a vague way. Many people say that people have no real purpose in life. <laughs> that we're simply just to enjoy ourselves for the brief years that we have here. And then we die. When we die, we just float off into oblivion. They say you don't have no purpose. They say you, 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 came, from, you came from this prehistoric situation and you spawned and all this stuff happened. And all of a sudden, you know, you were once a monkey. And then you kind of <laughs> you became a little bit more straight in your stance. And you lost a certain things and, and you're more cognitive and you, you lost hair. And, you know, now you're a human being. What? in the world our creative god could have certain traits that we share with monkeys but we are not monkeys we're not we're human beings created in his image so i ask this question if we don't have a purpose why do people continue to get married and start families? Why are we still procreating? Why are we still bringing new babies into the world if we have no meaning and have no purpose? Why would we do that? So another generation can simply live an empty, meaningless life and then just die? Absolutely not. Every single human being is created in the moral image of the eternal God. We were created in his image to have unhindered, intimate fellowship with him. Everyone is an eternal being and their spirit and soul will never die. We will either be raised up to honor in the resurrection or raised to shame. The Bible is clear. Father God has given everyone an equal opportunity to receive the free gift of salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. Second Peter 3, 9 says this. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But you see, each individual must come to a place where they recognize that they have sinned against God. Once a person is truly convicted of their sin against God, then they are ready to receive forgiveness for their sins and receive eternal life through Jesus Christ. Once you get revelation and clarity in these spiritual matters, you can begin to truly see what this life is truly all about. Until then, you'll never know what this life's about. And you'll be searching and searching and searching and studying and studying and studying and never finding it because it's only going to be found in the pages in the canon of Scripture. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 down through 24 tell us, Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must... No longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught of him as the truth is in Jesus to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. You can know for certain, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that you will spend eternity with Father God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, and all the saints of all time, if you simply make up your mind and wholeheartedly invite Jesus into your heart and follow then after him hard for the rest of your life. Revelation chapter 7 verses 9 through 12 tell us, after this I looked, and behold, a great magnitude that no one could number from 
every nation from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. That's where you should be saying amen. It says every tribe, nation, tongue, all these people. You're in that if you've accepted Christ as your Savior. It's irrefutable. No one can snatch you out of God's hands. Again, it's, it doesn't matter about your emotions. Some people say, I don't feel the love of God. Well, I mean, there's times you're not going to feel the love of God. That doesn't mean that you, he don't love you. That doesn't mean that you don't serve him. That just means that's just part of human existence. When do you always feel the love of your wife and your husband and your children? <laughs> Not all the time. Does that mean that they don't love you? No. So it's the same thing with our Lord. All right, six and seven. We're almost done wrapping this up. Before the silver cord is snapped and the gold bowl is broken or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the cistern and the dust returns to the earth as it was and the spirit returns to God who gave it. We see this statement, remember your creator before the silver cord is loosed or broken. Solomon again pleads with his readers to remember God before this life is over. And he repeated a variety of metaphors to describe the ending of this life. The application is simply this. The images that he points out are pointing to the value of life, silver and gold, and the drama and seriousness in the end of life whose pieces cannot be put back together. Remember, um, you know, what, what, it, what did the apostles say? Silver and gold I have not, but what I have I give to you. Get up and walk in the name of Jesus Christ. It's remembering the truth and walking in that truth. He goes on and says, Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. This is why it's so important, church, to remember our Creator in this life. Because when this life is over... Everyone will have to answer to the eternal God and we'll all have to give an account for ourselves. We're all going to have to stand before him and we're going to have to say, hey, (laughs) um, yeah, (laughs) I'm good because I have the blood of Christ covering me and I've put all my eggs in one basket and all my hope is in your son alone. And he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into my, you know, my, my fellowship of rest. And maybe if we did some stuff that didn't work out, that stuff will burn up. But, you know, whatever. All the good works that we did that were led by the Holy Spirit, you know, we're going to get rewarded for that. And if we don't have Christ to rely on, then, man, he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you, you worker of iniquity. And that's it. So you got to be prepared. I want to be prepared. Why would you ever chance the most important appointment that you're ever going to have? That's the most important appointment you're ever going to have. Forget your employer. Forget your new job. (laughs) Yeah, that's cool. I get it. But we need to be right before the God of this universe. Be prepared. Some people say this. Well, well, maybe I believe if if my good outweighs my bad, then I'll I'll be good before the holy God of all creation. It don't work like that. No, you can't just work with, with autistic kids and think that you're going to be saved. <laughs> you know, we've had people in, in my work that say, oh, you know, you've earned your wings. What are you talking about, bro? <laughs> uh, my heart's deceitfully wicked. You think because I'm helping these people and earning a paycheck doing this that I'm going to heaven off of that? Your trip and your theology is totally wrong. Let's correct it. Sit down. Let's have coffee. We'll talk about it. You see, we have no righteousness of our own to stand on. Our good deeds are but a filthy rag before God, meaning he doesn't need our good deeds to make us right before him. They actually can't make us right. It is the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, the anointed one that makes us right before the holy God of all creation. Romans chapter 5, 8 through 10 tells us, but God showed his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, how much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life? See, that's the thing. We're saved from his wrath. 
This is, this is why, church, we need to have a healthy, holy fear of God growing, growing in us every single day we live. Because the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom and the fear of God will usher in the love of God. But if we don't have a healthy fear of him, like as a, as a child, fear has a healthy respect and fear of their parents, then that child is willing to do anything they want because they have no respect. They have no regard for authority. If you have regard for authority, the holy fear of God is going to keep you from doing stupid stuff. It just is. You're going to sin less because you have a healthy, holy fear of God in your heart. And you're like, I ain't going there. I ain't doing that. It's just the truth. All right. Last verse. Verse eight. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. All is vanity. The bottom line is this. Life that excludes eternity and the eternal God is a life that is simply meaningless. But the ultimate in meaningless is vanity of vanities. All is vanity. With this under the sun premise, not only is life meaningless, but every single thing is meaningless. It's all vanity. Nothing has meaning without Father God at the center of it. As I begin to wind down this message, I, I want you right now to be completely honest with yourself. Have you ever come to a place in your life where no matter what you have done, no matter what you have pursued, no matter what you have tried to do, you have ultimately become bored with it? Like it doesn't stoke you. The way it once did, like it's it's lost, it's it's lost its pizzazz. And you're like, man, I'm just it just it's not the same. It's like my favorite donut. It's just not the same. I mean, I can have it. I can have one. And yeah, it might taste good, but it's just it's not the same. You know, like when you're young, when you first experience stuff, like the first time you went to the zoo and saw the elephants and the lions and the tigers and all that, you know, you get older. It's like kind of been there, done that. Have you ever, ever experienced something in your, sometime in your life where it's like this stuff that I'm doing, it just doesn't excite me like it once did. And if you haven't experienced that yet, I can guarantee at some point in your life, you will experience things losing their, 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 their interest or your interest in them. This is because church, everything temporal is passing away. Nothing temporal can fully satisfy the eternal part of you who you really are. This is why living without God is vanity. But in Christ Jesus, we can truly be filled with the joy, peace, love, and contentment that this world can never provide us. Psalm chapter 27 verse 4 tells us, one thing I have asked the Lord that I, that I will seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And I'll end with this. I stumbled across this this week as I was studying, and I found it very profound. Viktor Frankl was a Holocaust survivor. In his book, Man's Search for Meaning, relates uh, to some of his war experiences and understanding of life. And uh, some of these quotes he wrote, and it starts with this. It says, this striving to find a meaning in one's life is the primary motivational force in man. I think the meaning of our existence is not invented by ourselves, but rather detected. I turn to the detrimental influence of that feeling of which so many patients complain today, namely the feeling of the total and ultimately meaninglessness of their lives. They lack the awareness of a meaningful, a meaningful worth living for. And they are haunted by the experience of their inner emptiness, a void within themselves. This existential vacuum manifests itself mainly in a state of boredom. He's saying basically people are bored because they don't have meaning in their lives. Frankel warned of the, the danger of those who live without meaning. No instinct tells him what he has to do and no tradition tells him what he ought to do. Sometimes he does not even know what he wishes to do. Instead, he either wishes to do what other people tell him to do, which is conform, conformism, or he does what other people wish him to do, which is totalitarianism. This church is why today, if you sense the still, small voice of God gently wooing you to himself, do not harden your heart. The Bible is clear. Revelation chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. 
If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and be with him. And the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you just for Lord, how your word impresses truth upon us. You, you desire the best for us. You're not vengeful. <laughs> you, 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 you have elect. You've chosen your children. You, you're, you're, you're wooing us to yourself. Help us to, to involve more of our time seeking after you, doing the things that you would call us to do. Maybe inviting other people that you want to, to bless, to, to be involved and, and reach out to them, whatever it is, Lord, but just help us to hear from you clearly. Help us to sense and know that you truly do love us and that your desire is to bless us beyond what we could ever even imagine. Just giving us your peace, your love, your joy, not being anxious about anything, not worrying about anything, but, but casting all of our cares upon you, knowing that you will meet every single one of our needs all the days of our lives. Father, thank you for your mercy and your grace. I pray this all in your son Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen.